What's up, everybody? So I stumbled across the ancient city of Shabam here and thought it was kind of interesting, but I'm not really the most qualified guy to make a video on buildings. <laughs> or, well, maybe it's the opposite. I, I can't ask questions and turn this into a four-hour documentary like some people can. <laughs> because to me, mud brick skyscrapers are pretty self-explanatory. Somebody decided they'd try three stories, and then somebody else decided, well, I'll try four stories. And since the highest building is 11 stories, then I think the guy that built the 12-story one <laughs> found out that that was the maximum height of mud bricks. And after that, all the survivors agreed that 11 stories is high enough. I like how they have like 20 bullhorns up there for the morning prayer call. And if you stucco everything with some lime plaster, then it looks almost as magnificent as the world's fairs. But it does go to show how ingenuitive people are with the materials they have at hand. And if all you got around is dirt, well, then make mud bricks and hope it doesn't rain. This has been around since Roman times, but the present iteration of it is from the 1500s because it rained. <laughs> no joke. The old city was wiped out in a flood in the 1500s and they just built right back. This is located in Yemen, a part of the world that never gets talked about. And it's right on the edge of what's known as the empty quarter because it's just nothing but sand dunes for hundreds of miles. But there's all kinds of legends of lost cities out there because it wasn't always that way. You can see this one half excavated, but at one time it was probably completely covered in sand. Here's looking at a topo map and Shabam is right about here in a valley that goes on for hundreds of miles. And this was cut out by water erosion. You can see the bluffs in the background right here, and this looks just like any desert valley in the American Southwest that you'll drive through. I couldn't quite find the picture I was going for, but in the American Southwest, you have all of these flat valley floors that are surrounded by the bluffs. Here, it's just that the bluffs have been eroded away for the most part too. Only in the American Southwest, they say this is all due to wind erosion. And here they say that it's due to water erosion, where I personally think that they've got it wrong in the American Southwest and that was all water erosion too. Since it hasn't really rained in the last 200 years, they say it was wind but it hasn't really rained here for 500 years. And the last time it did, it wiped this town out. Shabam is actually more densely packed than Manhattan. And they've got all kinds of empty valley floor around there. So why did they condense everything down and pack everybody into this tiny footprint? Well, one of the reasons is for flood protection. You can't really tell from the photo here, but it is actually all elevated up from the valley floor around. And the other reason is defensive. They had a long history of desert raiders. Even if they do breach the city walls, then they got to go house to house down these narrow streets while people are up above dropping rocks on their heads. So it's actually more practical than just trying to be prestigious. The city's surrounded by all of their farm fields. Here you see women out working the fields. And, you know, people wear straw hats all around the world to keep themselves cool. They say there's parts of the year here where it never gets below 40 degrees Celsius, which is 104 Fahrenheit. But I don't know how much good that straw hat's doing when they have to wear full burkas. If anybody's looking to champion women's rights, then uh, here's a good place to start where they actually need it. You know, we are kind of spoiled in the Western world. We don't think twice about having furniture in the house, but there's still a large portion of the population of the world that doesn't have furniture. They just have a couple pillows around to get comfortable on. And I'm guessing this is actually a fairly well-to-do household. Uh, wood is at a premium in places like this because it's hard to come by. And you can see that the windows are all trimmed out with ornate woodwork. No glass. But you probably don't even want glass except for the floors that have air conditioning. Another thing that the Western world has kind of been conned into, in my opinion, is we don't have any interaction with livestock anymore. The way these are laid out, they usually use the first floor for storage. The second floor is for livestock. And I'm guessing that since there isn't much wood around, that serves a purpose too. This will probably sound gross to a lot of people, but I bet they shovel the dung, take it up on the roof and dry it out, then use it for fuel for fire. Which means, yes, dinner is cooked over some flaming poopies. It's been done that way for thousands of years in desert regions. The third floor is for the men, and then the fourth floor is for the women. Then the upper floor is for sleeping. 
that's another thing we take for granted in the Western world. There's still a lot of cultures out there that men don't ever associate with women that aren't their wives or family members. So if a guy has a couple buddies over, they don't ever actually meet the women of the family on the next floor up. We're just about done with the National Geographic version of this. Uh, get to what I find interesting in a second. I feel like I'm making the most boring video ever here. But they say that 16 guys work in the brick factory here and they can put out about 8,000 mud bricks a day. Is that still a thing where people look at old factories and say, well, where'd they get all the red bricks from? Well, I've shown how they do this in India by hand still to this day and burn everything in a kiln. And the only difference is they use red clay and then fire it, which makes it water resistant, just like pottery, where here they're just using mud and some sunshine to dry it out. A little straw in there to give it some compression strength. But if it ever rains, then it's just going to turn back into mud. So that's what happened back in the 1500s. And this is what I kind of found interesting about this, if anyone's still watching. So the first event they say happened in 1298 and the other in 1532. And those dates just are pretty close to coinciding with other events. 1298 is right there at the 1300s event that I've talked about a lot. We've got this recorded in England, but the more I dig into it, the more it looks like it was a worldwide event. In England, they refer to this as the Great Famine. This is when it just started raining nonstop for a couple of months to the point that it literally ripped all of the topsoil away. And of course, if you can't grow food, you can't eat food. We just had a modern day example of this with Hurricane Helene, and that was just two days of nonstop rain. Not to downplay that, that was horrible, but that was two days, and what happened in the 1300s was two months. So just imagine what would happen if it were still raining there. I know liquefaction has been the key word for all the cool kids the last few years, but water is immensely destructive. And there's no way to defend against this. It's just going to undermine your foundation, the whole thing sliding off down the hill. So this is probably what the majority of England looked like 700 years ago. It's even speculated that the story of Hansel and Gretel came from this time, which I believe is German, right? I'd have to look it up, but that would indicate that this is reaching into parts of Europe. And if it was nonstop rain for two months in England, I'm sure Europe got some of this. And now it sounds like all the way down at the bottom of Saudi Arabia, Yemen got it too. And you know you're in bad times when you have to warn the kids not to go around little old ladies out in the woods because they might eat you. Also around this time in North America, we saw pretty much the complete disappearance of the Mississippian culture, the mound builders in the Mississippi River Valley area. Recent studies suggest that a major flooding event occurred, and they do mean recent. When I started making videos just four or five years ago, I, I had speculated that this might be the case, and there was hardly any information on this. Maybe in the next five years, academia will connect the dots as to the reason why the Native Americans out west disappeared at the same time as well. Mesa Verde culture, the Anasazi, they all disappeared at the exact same time. And what you don't see just from looking at photos of this is they are like two or 3,000 feet up a mountain above the Cortez Valley down below. And all through the region, they started building their houses up under these bluffs in places that are honestly just a pain in the butt to have to live in. I mean, it's hard to go get your water. It's hard to, there's nowhere to grow your food anywhere close to there. They were trying to keep safe from something, but what is that something? Well, they say it's from rival tribes, but rival tribes don't fall down from the sky on you. I already have a lot of videos about all of the aerial phenomena that were witnessed during the 1300s when, when this was happening. But they were worried about things falling out of the sky on their head. That's why they got up under a mountain. So let's use that to connect some more dots. This was also wiped out in 1532 by another huge flood. So check this out. The first Westerner to explore this region was John Philby in 1918, and the locals told him about this legend. Far in the endless sands of the empty quarter are found ruins of the ancient city of Ubar. This was a large, old, and beautiful city which, unfortunately, was ruled by a wicked, lustful ruler. God punished Ubar and sent a destructive wind which eliminated all people in the city and turned it into ruins. 
The Bedouins also told Philby that large chunks of iron can be found in the ruins as large as a camel's hump. Due to this, they named the site al Hadida, Place of Iron. Now, it took Philby 14 years to come up with funding to be able to take a caravan out here and search the desert. Philby was hoping to go out and find something comparable to Petra, but never found this lost city. What he did find were two shallow craters and chunks of white sandstone, pellets of black glass, and also pieces of iron. Now, this black glass can only come from two sources, either volcanic, which will give you obsidian, or vitrification, which only really occurs in nuclear blasts or meteorite impacts. Now, the Bedouins said that this whole area was destroyed by arcane powers from the ancient gods. Keep in mind, this is right down the road from the old Canaanite pantheon, which I've got a couple videos on. But this is the kind of thing that the ancient gods did. I mean, they literally controlled the weather. That was, you know, rain god was a job title. It wasn't some ethereal mechanism. These gods knew how to bring rain to the desert areas. My own personal opinion is that these gods were technological instead of magical and that they knew when these impact events were going to happen beforehand, but they didn't actually cause them. But people still attributed these events to the wrath of the gods for thousands of years after they were gone. Later on down the road, scientists went out there and started investigating, and they came to the conclusion that the desert was hit with more than 3,500 tons of iron that broke apart, and each of these large pieces caused an explosion. These were so hot that they melted the sand, creating a hard sandstone layer on the bottom of the craters. And this layer contains pellets of sand and cosite, a variety of quartz, which is created by extreme explosions. Rain of melted metal and sand fell on the sand around the craters, leaving blackened sand and dark pellets, which by 90% consist of sand and by 10% of metallic meteoric mass. Now, I want you to remember the blackened sand all around for something here in a minute, but guess when all of this happened, according to the Bedouins? About 400 years before Phil B's expedition. So that was in 1918, minus 400 equals 1518. And when was the last time Shabam was wiped out in a flood? 1532, according to their numbers here. I, I guess if you're new here, I don't think that historical dating is quite as accurate as they make it out to be. But the last two times that this city was flooded out just happens to be within a dozen or so years of these major events. So it could just be a coincidence, but I think there's possibly something to that. And I know there's the, what, you think rocks fall from the sky crowd? Okay, give me one other explanation of how molten iron winds up sitting out in the middle of the desert. I'll wait. Oh, and by the way, Philby's impact crater is right here, and Shabam is right about here. And now I've got more evidence of aerial phenomena, meteorite impacts being associated with freak flood events. Okay, so all of this is over here in southern Saudi Arabia, and all of these stars are impact craters that I've tracked down. And you might see why I hypothesized that. Uh, impact craters may have something to do with desert formations because they're all in deserts or it's just another big coincidence. But I want to show you this one again. I've done this in another video. And here's what Philby's expedition reported about that other find. A rain of melted metal and sand fell on the sand around the craters, leaving blackened sand and dark pellets. Now, they actually say that this is volcanic in origin. And I'm going to do a video about this at some point because I think they are intentionally listing some geologic features as volcanic because it seems like academia is downplaying the frequency of these impact events. They act like these things only happened back in the dinosaur days when in reality they happen all the time on a geological time scale. Most of them just hit the ocean and I think it was around 2018 there was a really big one that hit off the coast of Canada. But this looks like it just happened last week, you know? Which probably means it was about four or 500 years ago, about the same time as Philby's impact. But this city was obviously built before the sand started engulfing everything. 
So if this impact crater were as old as this city, then it would be covered in sand too. Instead, you can see that all the char has just been blown into tiny wind rows, small sand dunes. Now, tie all of this together with the Green Sahara, if you guys have seen my videos on that. Maps from the 1500s show the Sahara having cities all over it, big, huge lakes. And then you have this line of impact craters stretching for a thousand miles and everything turned to desert. So it's just a hypothesis, but did a meteor come in, bust into a bunch of different pieces, and then, well, they just said that Philby's meteorite was 3,500 tons. Well, what if that was just one chunk of a bigger one that fell down in a bunch of different pieces? And I mean, the atmospheric temperature, you know, if it's hot enough when it gets down to the ground to actually melt the sand into glass, then theoretically it could have heated the atmosphere to the point that it just vaporized all plant life. All that's left after you subtract out all the organic matter is sand. And boom, you've got a desert region stretching for thousands of miles. Anyway, I told you I wouldn't be any good at making a video talking about mud brick skyscrapers, <laughs> but it is an interesting little town, and I think the two destructions of it lining up with other catastrophic events within a few years is pretty interesting. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll catch you on the next one. Static out.